today is March 4th, 2023, and we have a very special guest on the show today, Jamal Abdullahi. Jamal is a Somali-American engineer, community organizer, and writer. Jamal, thank you so much for coming on the show, and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Well, today I wanted to talk to you about two very important articles you recently wrote and were published in Black Agenda Report. The most recent article was published on March 1st, 2023, and is entitled, War Over U.S. Military Base Quest in Somalia Rages On. And the other article was published on February 8th, 2023, and is entitled, United States Pursuit of Imperial Military Base in Northern Somalia Fuels Brutal War. Can you explain what is going on in Somalia and what we should understand about the unionist versus secessionist struggle and the role of the U.S.? Uh, well, thank you, Ryan. Uh, so the conflict in Somalia has a um, quite of a long history, but the current spike right now, the current uh, you know violence revolves around the city of Las Anot and in the Seoul region, uh, you know northern uh, Somalia, and that has started it you know uh, December of uh, 2022. It started off as a, uh, a protest and people that are you know uh, complaining about. Uh, you know, um, uh, killings that are, uh, you know, people, uh, community leaders that were being killed in a very uh, suspicious, uh, you know, circumstances uh, that just basically, you know, uh, you know, um, blew the lid off in, uh, uh, in early uh, February, January, late January, April, February. That's where things just uh, come to an exclusion halt. But the fundamental struggle here in this particular one, Las Anod, is between a uh, um, a unionist who are trying to uh, search for a Somali republic, which politically collapsed in 1991, you know, almost over 30 years ago. And the on the other hand, there's a secessionist group who are mostly based in the uh, city of Hargeisa, in you know uh, further you know further north, uh, largest city in in, in Somalia. And uh, uh, this is a this conflict. The root cause of this conflict is a relic of a 19th century, you know, uh, colonization of you know uh, Somali territories. By then, uh, Somalia was divided into you know five regions, uh, and uh, three of them were controlled by uh, United Kingdom or you know Great Britain, uh, the Northern Protectorate, Somaliland, uh, what is today in you know Eastern Ethiopia. And the northern district front of uh, uh, Kenya, these were the regions that were administered and controlled by the, you know, uh, UK and Italy. And um, Italy controlled most of the southern regions of what is today of of, of Somalia. And uh, lastly, but not least, France controlled a uh, uh, colonized uh, Djibouti, a uh, one city, one country region that finally got independent in 1977 between a. Uh, um, a negotiation, political settlement between Somalia uh, and, uh, and and France. So in 1960, you know, uh, June, July, July, starting at June 26th and culminating to uh, Ju July 1st, 1960, the Republic of Somalia was born, and it primarily consisted of a what used to be, you know, British, you know, protectorate and a uh, um, a uh, uh, Italian, you know, Somaliland. The two after World War II sort of got together, uh, Britain and Italy got together and decided to form a new republic of of those uh, two regions. Uh, there are some revisionist historians who would determine because of a uh, the inability of two colonizers to a uh, coordinate a Pacific date. Um, where the uh, uh, the Somali Republic was going to be coordinated, it, that somehow interpret that as there was the uh, uh, two countries. So after the collapse, political collapse of the Republic in 1991, uh, there is this secessionist group who have been arguing over 30 years to no avail that the uh, uh, one time there was two countries and uh, Somalia needed to be split between those two. So the root cause in Las Anot is is based on that. But it did trigger because, uh, uh, you know, the northern region have been, you know, enjoying a somewhat, you know, relative stability compared to a, other regions of, you know, uh, uh, Somalia. So that's the root cause. And uh, uh, right now, 
Um, it's been going on over, uh, you know, a month now and in a, a complete open hostility in which the secession is to force this uh, and relentlessly been shelling in the city of Las Anot. And over, uh, you know, close to 200 people have been confirmed on the uh, unionist side and uh, uh, over uh, 100,000 to 200,000, some estimates to 200,000 have been displaced in the city of a, a, a Las Anot. Luckily, there's been an, a, a, a lull in the conflict in the last, uh, you know, a, a few or several days. Um, but, you know, uh, I think everyone is holding their breath and, and uh, anticipating a further conflict because the uh, uh, secessionists in Hargeisa have refused to simply withdraw from the city. And so some sort of a uh, uh, you know, uh, political negotiation, so some sort of a discussion kind of occurred. So that's what we had with, with Las Anod and the uh, northern region. Now, how does it, the United States fits into this? Okay, I think that's a, uh, you know, very fundamental question. Uh, so uh, for years, the secessionists, they have been working on this project of trying to split into Somalia um, to a no avail. But in 2022, just last year, okay, uh, through a lobbyist in Washington and through other uh, maneuvering and mechanism, they have came contacted to a uh, Senator uh, uh, Jim Rich of Idaho and, uh, um, you know, a, uh, the session is to give him a, a proposal that a, uh, um, if the United States were recognized this, you know, uh, you know, secessionist or support secessionist, that they could have a military based in a northern Somalia, a city called Berbera. And, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the project or the proposal never got a serious consideration in the, uh, in the Senate as a whole or in the subcommittee, the, the relevant subcommittee. However, the Department of Defense managed to get language into the NDAA, you know, the National Defense Authorization Act, which is about a $700 billion, if not, I, I believe it's close to a trillion now. Uh, that gets renewed, you know, every year. So they got a language there, which is directing the uh, uh, Department of Defense, as well as the uh, Department of a uh, Secretary, uh, Department of State, to engage this secessionist region in a uh, uh, directly bypassing a uh, very nominally function, you know, uh, federal government in Mogadishu or national government in in Mogadishu, and that has done two things. Okay, first of all, the secessionist got emboldened. You know, now, uh, you know, the, the calculation is different. Now they're saying, OK, here we have the uh, remaining only superpower, the great, you know, the great United States, you know, a champion in our cause and, and coming to our neighborhood to establish this, you know, a, uh, uh, this particular base. So they felt emboldened. And in fact, that is one of the reasons that it actually, you know, Im, you know, uh, impediment to a, a political negotiation, because they have actually misinterpreted the uh, uh, the link or the relationship between you know splitting Somalia and the United States establishing an a base in, in in Berbera, so in those two articles that you mentioned, uh, what we try to highlight it is to establish some of these you know uh, historical events and uh, uh, you know link it to the modern uh, uh, you know political atmosphere and what's going on in Somalia, particularly in the northern states. So um, to be clear, the, the secessionists, their their goal is to create uh, a separate country um, called Somaliland. And then unionists want to maintain uh, Somalia as a united country. Is, is that correct? That is correct. In short. Um, and the um, my understanding is that the U.S. already has a naval base in Djibouti, but they've sort of outgrown that naval base. Is that is that accurate? That's correct. So uh, uh, um, just a little bit about, you know, Djibouti, I think earlier in the conversation we alluded to, it's a uh, one city, uh, one, you know, uh, a within a country, uh, the entire country is largely, you know, within uh, uh, the city. The population there is majority ethnic, you know, Somalis. There are other ethnic groups as well, but that's the, uh, you know, nature of it. And uh, uh, since independence in 1977 uh, was ruled by only two, uh, uh, you know, uh, two men um, and an independent uh a fighter who died in 99 and the current dictator who's been running the country uh, uh, since then, you know, uh, Ismail Umar Gheli. And But he has been a beneficiary of a United States war on terror after September 11, you know, uh, you know, 2001. Uh, he has given access to the United States to the uh, port as well as other easements to sort of a, uh, uh, you know, uh, monitor and control that Gulf of Aden and a whole bunch of other, you know, uh, water areas. But to your point, 
you know, um, uh, Djibouti's port is a uh, uh, is is a commercial port. It is very busy. So planners at the Pentagon have been complaining quite some time that uh, uh, the port no longer meets the uh, uh, U.S. Navy uh, security protocol for these huge aircraft carriers, because I think, you know, one basic requirement is they wanted to block it off, I don't know, miles and miles uh, to make sure that there is no, you know, to make sure that this ship is, is safe. It's essentially a, you know, a floating city is what these things are. And as you can recall, uh, I think, you know, uh, you know, um, uh, many years back, uh, there was a, a terror attack on the USS Coal in, in Yemen. So uh, the United, the depending on planners are concerned about security in in the uh, um, in in the Djibouti port. So uh, this port in Berbera, which is you know very short from uh, uh, you know what is it at, has been a uh, uh, you know high target. Has been you know uh, you know they've done a lot of I'm sure they've done a lot of iterations and planning, and they have subtle uh, at this. By the way, the United States used to have a base in Berbera before in the 1980s when uh, Somalia had a, a central and functioning government. Um, however, after this collapse of the Soviet Union, the United States found that to be more of a, uh, you know, um, if not all but irrelevant. So it, it, it left. Uh, but right now, given some of the other emerging global competitors, like that of uh, China, it has found a, uh, uh, a necessary of an, an ever increasing military presence in that part of the uh, uh, Horn of Africa. Yeah, and you sort of alluded to this, but I, I want to uh, mention it, uh, have discussed it a bit more, is that the, why are those waterways so important? There's the Gulf of Aden, there's the Red Sea and the Suez Canal. Why is it so strategically important for the U.S. to have a military naval presence in that region? Well, you have, you know, uh, Middle East and the uh, uh, north of that. Uh, you know, you have a, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, south of that, there's, you know, Eritrea, Ethiopia, and and further a little bit north, there's a, you know, uh, Egypt and the Suez Canal that, uh, uh, you know, a uh, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, commercial uh, ships uh, do go through that. I think, I don't know if it was a, uh, a year or two ago, it may have been last summer, in fact, where a uh, uh, there was a jam in that. And that really disrupted a, a global, you know, supply chain in, adi in addition to the, uh, you know, pandemic. So the United States considers these waterways a very, very important for a, uh, uh, you know, um, a uh, supply chain activities. And, um, yeah, they're critical shipping lanes, is, is my understanding. And, and it, in addition, uh, there seems to be other interests as well um, in, in Somalia. My understanding is that there's 30 barrels of oil that, that, have, that seismologists have found that um, are untapped, as well as um, fishing, the looting of, of fishing off the coast of Somalia, um, and also my understanding is that Europeans are seeking to dump waste off the coast of Somalia, including nuclear waste. Uh, Norway, in particular, is trying to increase this. What what role um, does any of this have in, in the conflict? Well, uh, you know, so. Uh, like we, the Republic of Somalia, or you know, Somali Republic, politically collapsed in uh, 1991, and it sort of a go, went through a uh, you know three stages. I think the first 10 years or so, it was more of a uh, you know civil war where uh, you know clans were fighting you know one another. Then there was another uh, um, a decade where you know uh, some of the civic societies tried to negotiate some sort of a, a political you know settlement. But recently. Somalia has taken a turn for becoming a sort of this proxy battleground for, you know, uh, global competitors. And the center of that, uh, uh, you know, proxy problem is a natural resources. You know, you mentioned fisheries, you mentioned a, uh, uh, you know, oil, uh, you know, particularly offshore, you know, uh, offshore drilling in the United States. There is a uh, American company in the United States, I believe they're based in, in, in Texas, in which had got into an, in a, a very corrupt, uh, you know, a, a contract or agreement with the, uh, uh, you know, with the Phila Somalia. Phila Somalia is the presidential palace in, in, in Somalia, your equivalent of a, uh, you know, white, uh, 
uh, you know, a, a White House, if you could, uh, if there is a, uh, if there can be any such comparisons. But uh, they have, there's been, you know, uh, this deal. So you have all of these, you know, private entities, you have these global, you know, uh, uh, strategic competitors, you know, trying to be uh, chipped up each other. Uh, you know, uh, one thing that I think it's, it's very important that could, you know, a lead to an, 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 a, uh, you know, open hostility is this dispute between uh, Egypt and a, uh, um, Ethiopia over the uh, Nile River. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, the current president of Somalia, Hassan Sheikh Mohammed, I think has made a very, you know, um, you know, major errors in his first, uh, you know, 100 days in which he sort of, uh, you know, a, uh, entered or come in into this, you know, uh, uh, century old dispute between two, two countries and essentially endorsed, you know, Egypt is claim to a, uh, uh, you know, to these water rights on the uh, Nile River. Now, uh, you know, a, a coalition of a coalition of Egypt and Emirates and others are trying to establish military bases. So to sort of apply pressure and Ethiopia, which is a, you know, a, a much larger neighboring country, you know, uh, in Somalia. So you have all of these, you know, strategic competitors, the United States, the EU, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, some Gulf states, all trying to a, uh, angle for a position within uh, uh, Somalia for natural resource purposes, for strategic purposes, as well as, you know, sometimes a, a very dangerous of a, a toxic dumping ground. Um, you know, uh, the toxic dumping ground has a, a long history. It was back in the 1990s when uh, Somalia was going through a period of a, a chaotic, politically chaos and, and transition. A fellow named Ali Mahdi, uh, you know, got into an agreement with a, a, a Italian mafia group as well as a, and, and, and some other uh, you know, commercial or uh, some other private enterprises to basically use Somali waters and uh, uh, as a, a toxic, toxic dumping ground. And a lot of those have been either buried or they've been dumped in, in, in a, uh, uh, you know, in sea. And uh, uh, periodically, those that have been dumped are getting washed off to a uh, uh, Somali shores. So uh, it's a tragic story, you know, uh, and, and it's very, very, uh, you know, complex. And, uh, um, you know, for, uh, particularly people who don't watch it very closely uh, or don't have the, uh, you know, linkage, but it is very complex and very tragic. Yeah, and, and, and for viewers that may not be aware, the conflict between Egypt and Ethiopia regarding the Nile River is related to the, the, the construction of the Grand Renaissance Dam that Ethiopia is trying to work on. And I guess discussing kind of the regional uh, powers that are, um, have, have playing a role in this. How are weapons getting into Somalia? Because my understanding is that there's a United Nations arm embargo. Um, so how is it that weapons are, are making their way into Somalia? Uh, good question. So uh, uh, Somalia has been in an uh, uh, um, arms embargo for quite some time now, yet a uh, uh, weapon is still making through. Uh, particularly, you know, small arms. Somalia is washed with, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, small arms. Uh, you know, there and and it's mostly acquired in the uh, um, in the private, uh, you know, um, uh, market. Is is what it what is mostly acquired to. There are governments who bring it in uh, weapons uh, in 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 at least is somewhat symbolically compliant, you know, with the uh, uh, with the embargo. Uh, Egypt, uh, Uganda. A lot of them has brought it in some, you know, small arms ammunition in support of the, uh, you know, uh, Somali government. And uh, uh, oftentimes those ammunitions are found in the hands of a, uh, uh, you know, terrorist groups and and and, and clans that are the, uh, all part of the, uh, you know, chaos region. But I think there are two things that are worth noting, you know, in that, you know, uh, weapons or, you know, arms in, in, in Somalia. In the most recent uh, conflict in, in Las Anot, um, uh, Djibouti has a role of supplying mostly the weapons to the uh, uh, to the secessions, okay? And uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, there's been a documented cases where uh, you know a ammunition from uh, uh, Bulgaria, you know, uh, and the reason for this is a uh, uh, some of the weapons that are the secessions that are using to bombard city of Las Anod. These are a, a Soviet era. Uh, you know, weapons, and only few countries manufactured a, a, a munitions for those. And uh, um, in in um, Djibouti, uh, purchased some weapons, some ammunitions for the secessionists. 
that that you know uh, you know come through it and, and brought it into a uh, Somalia. So there are you know people will try to find a go around in 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 some of those. But to your point, that embargo you know is 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 there, and uh, uh, you know uh, I think there's discussions to be had whether that's working or whether it is a uh, you know vigorously you know uh, uh, enforced. Um, the other thing that's uh, wor- noteworthy it is this week alone, the United States uh, brought it in in 61 ton of weapons and ammunitions in, in a, a pair of a uh, C-130 in just uh, uh, you know a, a military based called Balidogli, just outside of a uh, uh, you know Mogadishu. Obviously, you know the question remains to be seen: who is going to use you know uh, these arms? To a uh, you know uh, uh, because the claim of the United States is that these are to fight and, and defeat you know Al Shabab, but uh, I think the question remains to be seen who is going to use you know to fight this. Uh, one thing that very became very clear this week it's been going on some time, and a lot of us, those of us who watch the situation closely, were aware of it. Is that a uh, um, you know just about seven months ago when a uh, uh, the current president declared a, a total quote unquote total war against Al Shabab. He had about somewhere between 15 to 17,000 uh, battle-ready Somali troops. This week, it became very clear that uh, uh, troop is, is spent. So now the United States is bringing in more armies. Who's, who's going to use those? Is that going to be a, uh, uh, does it mean there's going to be a more footprint or a, uh, of direct soldiers, of American soldiers on the ground? Because to this point, it has not been. There have been about a, a 700 to 1,000 American troops in, in uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of covert operations that the public is not aware of it, but what's on paper, what's on record, what's in the public domain is about 700 to 1,000 troops who are mostly advisors and trainers and, and what have you. But, uh, uh, you know, I think you don't have to be a, uh, a, a military person to figure it out that a 61 ton of uh, ammunition, uh, you know, a, 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 a 700 to 1,000 troops will be, you know, uh, using that. So there's there's a uh, um, I think there's more fighting and and you know to be had and uh, uh, so and the um, and, but but that's that's what I would say about the arms in in Somalia right now. Yeah, and to add on to that, and I think maybe I learned it from your article that, that there there was a, a commander of the secessionist um, side, the se- secessionist militia, who confirmed that he was fighting on behalf of Djibouti during a, a, a press conference on uh, February 18th, 2023. So that- That's correct. And, and uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, what that meant basically is that he's trying to rob around himself in this uh, old mantra of war on terror in which the uh, you know, United States uh, uh, would, would fund or support anyone who you know, uh, legitimately or illegitimately claims that they were fighting a uh, you know, terrorist. So his point there was, hey, we are defending a, uh, uh, Djibouti and, and, and Ethiopia and, and, you know, and others, but that's a, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a total joke. You know, that's not a, uh, uh, you know, a realistic. But his point, the point that he's trying to make here is that a, uh, uh, you know, he's trying to wrap himself in this war on terror mantra to have a uh, American weapons flow through him through Djibouti because of the, uh, you know, embargo. That's what he was his angle in, and that's what he was, you know, uh, referring to. Yeah, and, and regarding the U.S. influence, um, some a couple of things that should be noted are, uh, um, or that I want to see if you have more to say is the the role of the uh, the private military. My understanding is that it's, it's, it's contractors, U.S. military contractors that are doing the training of of Somali special forces um, and um, and the military and, and the military lobby in the U.S. that is benefiting from this. I know you talked about Idaho Senator, uh, I think his last name is Rish, um, yes. and also the Transportation Secretary uh, Pete Buttigieg um, and his influence in all this. Any thoughts on all that? So um, there are a lot of contractors, private contractors, security contractors in Somalia. And they're mostly concentrated in this sprawling complex on uh, uh, Mogadishu Airport. It's called Halani. It is off limit to a, uh, Somalis. Somalis are not able to go or uh, you know not able to be you know uh, to be there. So you have all of these you know private contractors who are doing you know uh, uh, who knows. But I think the most uh, uh, prominent one is this company called Bancraft. 
and uh, um, they have a uh, uh, had a contract with you know uh, both the uh, in, in the State Department as well as a uh, uh, you know uh, Department of Defense to provide to your point you know uh, uh, to deliver trainings to deliver supplies to basically do the uh, uh, the nuts and bolts of a uh, operationalizing uh, you know a uh, uh, war strategy now. That seems to be changing, uh, particularly, you know, uh, this week. Um, um, you know, one of the things that happened this week was that the United States uh, uh, operations, which is being run by, uh, you know, off of the embassy in, in Mogadishu, uh, seems to uh, directly take uh, you know, all of this, uh, you know, struggle against al-Shabaab, you know, this war against al-Shabaab. And uh, uh, one of the things that they have done is a, they have embedded these reporters into United States Special Forces. Uh, there was a piece published by the you know, New York Times, uh, your uh, uh, local paper, but uh, international papers for many of us, um, is that uh, uh, one of their reporters was embedded in there and uh, uh, confirmed some of the things that many of us have been saying about the, uh, uh, you know, um, the, uh, uh, the Somali National Force and how it's been grossly mismanaged and uh, uh, ended up either deserting or killed or wounded under a, uh, a very you know corrupt uh, leadership. Now, uh, so 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 there's that you know uh, uh, embedded reporters. We can all recall uh, you know uh, episodes of Iraq and Afghanistan and how this was sort of a uh, uh, basically a managed propaganda. Is is you know uh, embedded reporters is nothing more than in a uh, because because once a reporter is identified a, as an embedded, the uh, uh, the public relations officer in that unit owns the narrative that's going to be you know uh, uh, you know uh, coming out. So the United States have been commissioning this uh, uh, you know uh, embedded reporter uh, episodes. Uh, I think M a, a reporter from NBC TV was there. There was a uh, you know New York Times. So they're 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 there as you know uh, uh, as well. So 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 there's that. And the other thing that sort of struck me here is that it is the first time in a long while that I have seen. In fact, I think a uh, um, perhaps a uh, uh, you know since Operation Hope in in the early 1990s that I saw a uh, a, a American general, a, a, a lieutenant general, two-star Navy general setting up a base in Somalia. So with all of these, you know, given the uh, uh, commission. Commissioning of a uh, uh, you know embedded reporters, a generals being on the ground, Somalia setting up a, a sprawling you know military base. All of those seems to shift. It seems to indicate a shift of United States strategy. And and finally, the other thing that actually happened that sort of indicated that there is a, a change of a, a, a you know strategy. There was a meeting in Washington D.C. that consisted of that consisted of a, a United States, the uh, United Arab Emirates, the Qataris, uh, Turkey. And UK and obviously United States is chairing that. And the uh, topic of discussion was uh, Somalia. There are some, you know, uh, you know, information indicating it largely revolve around how to finance this newly found war by the, uh, you know, United States. So, uh, uh, you know, all of those things are, you know, indicating a shift of a, uh, uh, you know, uh, strategy for the United States when it comes to fighting, you know, Al Shabaab in Somalia. Yeah, and I think one of the the of, of one of the there's a saying that the first casualty in war is the truth, um, and so that's one of the problems with having these embedded reporters. Another issue is that we we hear at least in Western media is that the conflict in in Somalia is is clan based. That it, it you know it's kind of like this almost racist um, you know colonial mentality. What is your response to the claims that the the issues in Somalia are just warring clans? Um, what's your response to that? That's a uh, um, a flat out false. Uh, the um, clans, um, uh, you know, characterizing all the political problems through clannish lenses is a, a problem invented by uh, a mostly you know colonial era European uh, anthropologists. You know, these are the, uh, sometimes not very sharp and and, and inept. You know, uh, uh, folks that come to Somalia, they get grants through either some nonprofit organization in Europe or, or the, sometimes even their own governments to a, a sort of a collect intelligence. They would come to Somalia. They would, you know, publish some articles or sometimes some books. And everything that they re write or, you know, a, a say about Somalia revolves around clans. Yes, clans are, 
a, a, a mechanism and an organizing structure uh, uh, for Somalia. But not all of its ills and, and all of its, uh, you, know, uh, you know, conflicts revolve around in, in, in clans. And, you know, in fact, the concept of clans is, 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 is a structure such that it's like an, you know, onion, you know, it never stops. But uh, one of the things that these, uh, you know, uh, commentators and, and uh, you know, anthropologists do is to, they were never described, you know, uh, Somalia as a country. They were just described it as a country of, of a, as a collection of clans, which is very, very wrong and fundamentally, you know, erroneous. Clans do live in a country. You know, there is a recognized border. Somalia is a republic that got its independence in 1960. It's a member of the uh, UN. It has a flag that's standing on the top of your head that, that it is part of the, uh, you know, international community. This is a country. Yes, when people run into, you know, when, when there is a conflict, clan is one of the uh, uh, motivators or one of the organizing tools that people use to organize in tools. But so is money, Okay. Uh, uh, there was an uh, article here in, in, uh, that was just published you know, recently. And one of the things that they uh, you know, highlighted is how natural resources or you know, a, uh, you know, economic uh, theft is contributing to some of these conflicts. So uh, uh, the notion that you know, everything about Somalia is clannish is just a bogus. Yeah, and, and um, this is probably... One of, the, one of the more important questions that I probably should have led with it, but how is the broader geo, geopolitical situation impacting Somalia, specifically the conflict in Ukraine, Cold War II, or as many are, are already referring to it as, Cold, as, as World War III, and the fact that the U.S. and its colonial um, in, in European allies are trying to reverse the rise of China in a multipolar world, what impact has this had on, on Somalia? I think the China factor, the, the competition between China and the United States, along with its European ally, is certainly a major factor. As far as the uh, uh, the Ukraine war goes, uh, to my knowledge, I'm not aware of a uh, either you know direct link or you know direct influence, uh, except that, that there is a uh, you know uh, occasional discussion of a, uh, a grain and an impact to a uh, food export uh, that has not been much, but. To, to your latter part of the uh, you know competition with with China and uh, uh, anybody that's associated with China, the United States wanted to uh, either you know drive them out or keep them out is a major part of what's going on in Somalia. And, and speaking of which, uh, my understanding is Somaliland, the, you know, the secessionists established relations with Taiwan, which also included the opening of representative offices in the respective countries, um, and and so it's clear that. Um, you know, the, 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 the secessionists are looking to, 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 to uh, put a wedge in and, and support the U.S. agenda and their own agenda. <laughs> Excuse me. Well, that's, that's pretty ironic, isn't it? Uh, uh, here you have a, a group who have been pushing, you know, split in Somalia over 30 years, and all they have to show for is a, uh, a contact for a, uh, um, a, 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 uh, a island where no one else recognizes, uh, and and the only thing that it has done is a uh, just brought out the wrath of a uh, uh, China, you know, a, a rise in power, if not already a, a superpower. So that's a uh, uh, you know, I think I think it it it's just convoluted further and complicated the geopolitics elements that are the impacting you know uh, uh, you know uh, Somalia, but. I think the Chinese and the United States they take a uh, you know very different uh, you know approaches and a very different you know uh, at least at a uh, tactical level. Uh, the whatever the China is doing right now is 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 they're doing it very very quiet, and uh, um, um, the United States on the other hand is a, a very vocal and and, and very uh, you know uh, uh, vigorous. So. A lot of times what we see in the public domain is the uh, United States a uh, messaging or positioning that it is a, uh, you know, a, uh, um, um, you know, uh, pushing up. Yeah, and I think in addition to a kind of a vocal versus quiet approach, the Chinese have also, instead of trying to, to um, put weapons and military contractors um, and, and basically steal natural resources, my understanding is China is in the process of developing 80 
infrastructure uh, projects such as hospitals, highways, and also working on uh, media um, media related infrastructure. Um, but do you have any thoughts on the differences between China and the United States and, and North Atlantic allies and their uh, right, right. interactions? So China does have an embassy in the United States, uh, in, in Somalia, Mogadishu. Uh, so is the United States. Uh, they have done, you know, they do most of their, uh, uh, you know, operations uh, through that. But I think uh, um, a ace in the hole for China in this a, uh, uh, competition is Ethiopia. Uh, as you know, um, you know, um, United States all but lost all the control of the influence that it had in Ethiopia uh, by primarily betting in on a, uh, uh, you know, a, a brutal group called TPLF. That has been running the country for some, you know, 17 years. That group has been defeated, and uh, uh, you know, Chinese were a large part of that. Uh, uh, you know, uh, defeat or contributed it. You know, uh, to that, uh, they have a lot of a, uh, uh, you know, a gas and exploration. You know, exploration in, in in Ethiopia, particularly in the eastern part of Ethiopia, which is a Somali inhabitant. Uh, uh, you know, uh, region that it is a uh, uh, that's you know borders with with Somalia. In fact, uh, uh, the border between Ethiopia and Somalia was never you know uh, formally demarcated. So uh, uh, you have a, a constant movement of people and and uh, uh, you know goods between you know uh, these borders. Um, so the, the that's I would say Ethiopia now is more of a China's operation center. When it comes to the Horn of Africa, um, at least I'm not aware of a, a large footprint or projects that it has executed or uh, you know commissioned in in Somalia. But I think they can have a, a significant influence coming through Ethiopia. And then um, going back to U.S. politics, um, earlier this year the Republicans took control of the House. Um, Representative Il Ilhan Omar was removed from the Foreign Affairs Committee. And despite the fact that she is part of the, the squad and touted as one of the most, if not the most progressive elected official in Washington, my understanding is that many Somali Americans welcomed the fact that she was removed from the House Foreign Affairs Committee. What is your assessment of Representative Ilhan Omar and her record on Somalia and the region? Uh, so uh, there are eight congressional districts in Minnesota and Somalis live, you know, uh, all eight of them. And they, uh, uh, you know, uh, vote. And uh, um, when uh, people are discontent about something, uh, they uh, make sure that their congressional representatives uh, are aware of their, uh, you know, uh, discontent. And uh, um, you know, I think what you're, uh, you know, alluding to there in in fifth congressional district, in which uh, Representative Alhan Omar represents, um, is centered in Minneapolis, and that has a, uh, uh, you know, a large uh, Somali population. And uh, um, I think there's been some footages of a uh, people, uh, you know, showing a discontent with a uh, some of her uh, performances. But uh, as far as the uh, uh, the foreign relations uh, committee, you know, uh, assignment goes, uh, the biggest problem right now in in the fifth congressional district is housing. There is a huge homeless problems. You know, uh, uh, you know, uh, in in the city of uh, uh, Minneapolis. So I think you were uh, the constituencies here are asking about it. You, you won't heard about a uh, uh, you know, especially if you speak of the you know the majority you know uh, community and as well to a large extent to the uh, uh, you know Somali communities. Yes, you know, uh, here you have an immigrant community who happen to have a, a very strong link link in uh, in Somalia. But uh, uh, if you look at the fifth congressional district right now. Um, I think people would, uh, uh, you know, welcome a, um, a, the representatives being in the housing and banking committee, for instance, rather than in the uh, um, in the foreign relations committee. So uh, uh, from here on the ground, that's the that's the problem. There's a huge homeless problem, and people are looking for leadership to a, at the federal level to a, uh, address things like a, you know affordable housing and uh, uh, you know and, and, and other uh, amenities. Thank you for explaining that. Those are all the questions I had for you today. Is there anything you wanted to add before we close? No, it's been great uh, talking to you. All right. Thank you so much for coming on the show and we look forward to having you back. Thank you. Thank you.